Friends, if you hold your hands out like this, is a sign of receiving, and we're going to say this creed together. I'm not what I do. I'm not what I have. I'm not what people say about me. I am the beloved of God. It's who I am. No one can take it from me. I don't have to worry. I don't have to hurry. I can trust my friend Jesus and share his love with the world. Thanks, you can, you can be seated and believe it. It's true, it's orthodox, it's biblical. We believe in grace. Well, today, uh, I'm gonna speak on really what I think is the theme of Christianity, which is that in our weakness, God is made most strong. I have realized in ministry that trying harder has not made me a better pastor. That took me a long time to figure out. Early on in ministry especially, so much of ministry was like swimming upstream, trying to manufacture things, trying to make things happen. But the more I started living with a posture of an open hand and trust, and just tried to be obedient to God and, and really honest about who I am, when I started preaching and talking without a mask, and when I stopped trying to be different up here than I am when I'm hanging out with you guys, and, and I just bobby all the time, that, that's when, when I was just honest and vulnerable, that's when uh, um, I started to make a difference. So trying harder didn't help me in ministry. Letting go did. And in marriage and in my friendships, being the tough guy and being the strong guy um, didn't make me a better husband and a better friend. Um, being the weak guy, the vulnerable guy, the deeply seen guy did. And that's still a process for me. So the first thing is this. That when you are weak, you are strong because when you're, you're vulnerable, you're actually very brave. And God uses those things to, to help you connect deeply with him and with others. The second thing that I'm going to really say today is a quote from my dad. And I, I, never, I just love this. He actually wrote a book on it. When you're down to nothing, God is up to something. You've heard that? When you're down to nothing, God is up to something. That is absolutely right. What? Yeah, it actually says Bobby's dad. Yeah, that's right. Guess who puts these slides together? I do. Well, no, let me say that again. Guess who puts these slides together? Hillary does when I email her on Saturday night. No, but the, I, I tell her. Anyway, yeah, when you're down to nothing, God is up to something. This is so true. That there's this bizarre sort of roller coaster thing in life that Christians, when we are in the valley looking at the mountain, that is exactly where we are going. I want you to know, no matter how deep you are down the hole, God is up to something in your life, and I want you to know, if you respond with faith, good things are going to happen. In 2 Corinthians, Paul is, um, is writing to the church, and, and he starts talking about this, this thorn. And one of the things I love about Paul, Paul is very direct, sometimes brutish in his writing. Um, but he's just him. He's just very raw. He's just like very much, this is me. This is who I am. Deal with this. Paul, as a young man, was a Pharisee and a rabbi. And so Paul came from a new culture of rabbis where everything was hedged. And it was all about not only perfection, but perfection and protecting your perfection. So it was like, you know, perfection to the law was like honor the Sabbath. But perfection of perfection was don't spit just in case you might be breaking the Sabbath. So they had layers and layers of stuff they had to do. And I know people and I know religion. And can I just tell you, I know the environment Paul was in as a young man. He was an idealistic young guy. He believed the old guys actually were perfect. And then he didn't recognize that probably a lot of those guys he thought were perfect were just really good at hiding things. And so Paul was in this world of legalism. I have to be perfect. Um, if you're in the kingdom of God, when you do everything perfect and you're out, when you mess up. He moved from that to an actual, real encounter with the resurrected Jesus Christ. Where his life was completely transformed. And the first book Paul writes, Galatians, as a young guy, is just smothered in grace. It's just, God is so gracious and... All of my good works are just junk compared to the glory in Christ Jesus. And it just goes on and on about how awesome and amazing the love and the grace of God is for messed up, broken sinners like me, Paul. He moved from a world of perfection 
and management, sin management, to a world of, of grace. And can I just remind you, and I want to say this every time, grace doesn't mean mercy. Grace is merciful, but, but grace is an overflow of God's very person. It's an overflow of his love and favor for you. It's, it's akin to, in Greek, charis is, is where we get Eucharist from, to be thankful. There's a sort of gratitude and joy. And can I ask you a question? And this is a real question. Do you think God is thankful for you? It's what it reads in Greek. It reads like that. Charis, grace, is like thank, thankfulness. I think there's something akin to that in the, the feeling God has for his children, for you, for you and for me. And that's, that's very good news. Did you know when Jesus was baptized, he was experiencing God's grace? He was sinless, right? He wasn't experiencing God's mercy. He didn't need mercy. He was experiencing an overflow of God's love and power. When God said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Can I tell you? That's what God says over you. You are God's beloved son. You are God's beloved daughter. And he's pleased with you. He's pleased with you. I'm pleased with my children, even though they've, they've never done anything really that great. <laughs> They're four and six, you know. They've, they've done some, you know, they've done some drawings and they've done this and that. But I'm so, I take pleasure in them. I'm so pleased in them, but not because of what they do. Right? All right. So, uh, so Paul moved in this world of grace. And so he says, I've got this thorn. I've got this thorn and it's been driving me crazy. And I pleaded with God three times, take this thorn from me. And you know what God's response was? My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in your weakness. You, one of the, real quick on this thorn thing. The, theologians for a long time have you know, theorized about what this thorn is. It could be a sin in Paul's life, some sin he hasn't been able to defeat or whatever. It could be a, a uh, you know, some kind of physical ailment. Uh, it could be a person. But everybody agrees on one thing. It's a good thing he didn't say what it was. Because all of us have thorns, you know? And he says, even though he doesn't say it in the passage, I boast about my thorn. I tell people about my thorn. Because in my weakness, I am made strong. He actually says, I am made strong. When I talk about my thorn, when I talk about this, whatever it is, sin or this person or the sickness, or this whatever, when I talk about it, uh, I'm made strong. He said, I delight in my weakness. I delight in insults. I delight in hardships. I delight in persecution. For when I am weak, I am strong. And I, I think there's something so good about that for especially religious people. Th that we are done uh, trying to prove ourselves to others. We are done hiding we're done wearing masks. It's time to be honest and vulnerable that we actually are human beings. That we actually do make mistakes. We actually do uh, need help. That's a very strong thing to do. That's not a weak thing. It takes courage to talk about your thorns. That's not weak. That's very hard and very scary to do. That's not what the world teaches us. The world teaches us, put your best foot forward, show all your strengths, um, exaggerate your strengths, and hide all your weaknesses. But in the kingdom of God, things are upside down. That's not what you do in the kingdom of God. You talk about your weaknesses. You show them first to God and then to, to people who love you. You don't have to show them to everybody. Not every, no, everybody hasn't earned the right to see your weaknesses, but... It, but you show it to the people that love you, that people that, are, that believe in you, you show it to God, and you say, this is... These are my struggles. And it takes faith to do that. You know, I just so believe that one of the most toxic things for Christians is, is hiding and pretending. And that's been one of the worst things that's been damaging in our message to, to, to society is hypocrisy, hidden people. Hypocrisy literally means actors, those who wear costumes. I, uh, I didn't realize it, but, you know, my, my life is, everybody's life has been hard. My life has been hard, too, actually. And I know, you know people think, well, you had a rich and famous grandpa. That's true. Um, can I tell you that doesn't make your life easier? Uh, you know, my parents 
are both amazing parents. My step-parents are great step-parents. But there's something that happens to a kid with divorce and moving a lot. Uh, when I was young, I was very tender-hearted. I was bullied a lot. And when I started playing sports and I got a little bigger and a little stronger, I became the tough guy. And, and I, I, when, I, when I was a kid, I felt deeply for people. I, I, I really loved people, and I, I, I would cry when I saw somebody hurting, and I would love to hug people and loved to tell just about everybody, I love you. And that was my true self. But through the woundedness and hardship of my life, I learned that it's much safer to be the warrior, to be strong, and to put on armor, and to not let anybody in. And something happened to my soul that I became calloused and hardened, even into my faith with God, to the point where it was hard to feel emotionally. I, I remember when someone very dear to me, this is the first time I noticed my numbness, someone very close to me uh, was on the brink of death, someone I loved dearly. And in my head, I was like, this is one of the people I'm closest to, but I don't feel anything in here. And I knew something was wrong, but I didn't know anything about it. Ten years ago, I met with Bill Gaultier, who was a co-worker at the Christ Cathedral and happened to also be a licensed therapist and a pastor to pastors. And I only recognize now this was he was totally planning on doing this. But we just started hanging out and getting coffee and praying together and being pastors together. What I didn't realize for years and years is I was actually getting therapy. <laughs> he tricked me into therapy. <laughs> and all he was doing was teaching me to talk about uh, the, the challenges of life, my stressful day, my wounds, what it felt like to have somebody insult me or disrespect me or, or to get my heart broken. And, and I remember I, I started talking to him intentionally about this because I've always been a little bit of an obsessive guy. When I get a, something I'm into, I get really into it. And at the time, there was this totally innocent hobby, and it had just completely consumed my life. And I was talking to him about this. I said, you know, all I can think about is this thing. And it, I feel like it's hurting my friendships and my marriage and my church. And that was sort of the beginning. So this went on of me learning to be open and honest with Bill. And he started teaching me how to do that with Hannah and with my friends. And it took years, but then it was like my emotional life, that kid that had become calloused and tough started to come back, back to life. It was like, have you ever fallen asleep on your arm? And you wake up, and it's just, you, you could, like, cut your arm off, and it wouldn't even hurt, you know? But the, you start to rub it, and it actually is painful at first. It tingles, and then it, it really hurts. That's what coming to life emotionally was like for me. And it happened because I started being vulnerable, honest, and receiving empathy from people who love me. It's time that we get more vulnerable. It's time to start opening up and become more vulnerable. And then it, this came to a head. So... I got to a place where I never cried, ever. And I started feeling my emotions again. And then, it was the week my grandma Schuler died, I went to Holland, and I was preaching to 4,000 people in a cathedral who had come from all around the country to see me. And I was having this great sermon, you know, it was so good, and it was funny, and everybody, you know, I mean, everybody was into it, you know. And I started telling the story about my grandma Schuler when she was in her 20s and was pregnant. And I pictured my sister Christina, who at the time was pregnant, and something about that image, the death of my grandma, but picturing her as a pregnant young woman just locked me up. I completely forgot about what I was talking about. And I began to weep on stage and couldn't stop. I literally had to step away for about five minutes just weeping, I think that was a very good thing. A lot of people there probably didn't understand why I was weeping. I mean, and then, but even as it started coming back, I remember this is not long ago, two years ago maybe, I was telling some other story here in the second service, and I began weeping again. And I was saying stuff like, oh, I'm sorry, oh, I never weep, I don't cry, I don't do this. And actually, Chad pulled me aside, he's like, don't do that. He's like, if you're weeping, just weep, just own it, you know? It's like, you're right. 
So this is not a finished testimony. This is a, a thing I'm in right now. That I've recognized as a leader and as a husband and a dad and all of these things that those have nothing to do with being vulnerable and with being honest. I had to learn to be vulnerable about my pains and my wounds and I had to do it with loving people and I had to receive empathy. And you do too. When you are vulnerable with the people you love, it is not weakness, it's a strength. That's why you're strong when you're weak. That's why being honest when you're insulted and being honest about your hardships, being honest about when people persecute you or, or harm you or disrespect you and, and receiving love and compassion and empathy from people is going to change your life because you create space for the Holy Spirit to enter in and go to work on those things. And it brings you to life emotionally and almost more importantly, it allows you to become that person who feels what other people are feeling. And that's, that's hard sometimes to, to, many of you are very good at this. And it's, you feel it as like a burden, like I always feel the hardships of other people. That's a good thing. Compassion literally means to suffer with. When you suffer with others, it's, it's, it's not suffering that's the worst, it's suffering alone that's the worst. And compassion says, you will not suffer alone, I am with you and you will get through this. And I have that for you. If you're down to nothing, God is up to something. You don't have to hide your failures. You don't have to be, pretend to be more successful than you are. You don't have to pretend to be holier than you are. You don't have to pretend to be a perfect parent or perfect grandparent. Or if you're in ministry, you don't have to pretend to be a perfect pastor or teacher. Or whatever it is, you don't have to pretend anymore. You can be you. And you are loved. And God's proud of you and I'm proud of you. I am. Living in God's strength means that we move from shame uh, to joy. Joy in the fact that some of these things, they just are what they are. And we can trust that God is going to work in them. Brene Brown, uh, she did the study of like, how do people connect deeply? And she found that the greatest thing that keeps people from connecting deeply with one another the greatest human need to connect with others deeply was shame. This thing, shame, is, is the main thing that gets between us and c connecting with God and with others. And that is the thing. Sin and shame is the main thing that Jesus came to remove from our lives. In fact, when you see Jesus on the cross, what we often don't show with Jesus on the cross is the shame. We show the woundedness, we show the pain, but Jesus was crucified naked. There was no loincloth. He was seen, he was beaten, he was treated like a pig, like an animal, and hung naked on a cross. And it's so important because the Savior of the world took our shame, he was shamed that we could receive glory in belonging with the Father. You belong. You are loved. You don't need to feel shame. Feel hope. Feel hope that whatever it is you're facing God is going to carry you through. Can I get an amen? amen? Don't feel shame about your failures. Brene Brown said, if you could create a Petri dish for shame, it would be silence, secrecy, and judgment. I think there are three movements of, that have to be done by faith in order that we can live in strength in the midst of our loss and weakness. Um, so the first movement is to move from silence to honesty. Um, I have no problem telling it like it is. That is something I need to, I need to go the other way. But my wife, Hannah, <laughs> my wife, Hannah, never gets angry, almost never raises her voice. She is an absolute peacemaker. And that was, uh, we talked, she said, this is okay, I could say this. If you're, if you're feeling nervous. <laughs> so Hannah uh, w is learning to feel angry. <laughs> That's a good thing for someone like Hannah. Because psychologists actually say shame is when anger is pointed inward, when you're angry at yourself. So if you never feel angry, and you're constantly saying you're sorry even though you didn't do anything, you're probably someone who struggles with shame. But don't feel shame about struggling with shame. <laughs> 
Hannah's, this is the cutest thing ever. Can I say it's cute? I don't mean that condescending. Hannah just started saying, like when somebody would bump into her and not apologize or cut in line, she wouldn't say it out loud, but she just started saying in her head, don't mess with me. <laughs> don't mess with me. I, was, I think that was so good, because what she was doing is learning to recognize, I felt disrespected by that. And then she would bring that to me or to her friends and say, I felt disrespected when this person totally bumped into me. I was carrying a cup of coffee and it spilled on my dress and they didn't even say they were sorry and they didn't even care. And then I could say to her, of course you felt disrespected. That was super disrespectful. There's something about, you don't, people don't understand how important that conversation is for the soul. That, that if we don't say that, we're actually building into our mind and into our heart shame. What we're actually saying is, I don't deserve to be respected. You deserve respect and dignity. I believe that more than anything. Every human deserves dignity because every human being is loved by God. So it is important to move from silence to honesty, to, to talk about these things. Move then too from secrecy to openness. Allow yourself to be seen deeply. Confession is at the core of salvation. You cannot be saved unless you are honest. Confessing our sins and our, and, and our flaws and our worries and our fears is at the heart of redemption and resurrection. By, but that takes faith, doesn't it? That I'm not going to be judged, not going to be belittled, not going to be abandoned or, or not be kicked out of my church or my family. Guess what? If you are, that you weren't supposed to be there anyway. Right? Move from secrecy to openness and allow the people you love to see you deeply. And finally, move from judgment to grace and empathy. You need empathetic people in your life. You need it. People that love you, that do not judge you, that come alongside you, that defend you when you're bullied, that are on your side. I'm one of them. This church is there for you. But you need close friends um, who can incarnationally show you the grace and empathy of Jesus Christ. Move from judgment to grace and empathy. Friends, I want to tell you, whatever you are going through, whatever you're facing, whatever your losses are, God's got it under control. It's going to be okay. Today, you can relax and you can recognize and proclaim over your life, in my weakness, I am strong. That when I become weak in some areas, I become much stronger in other areas. And that is an opportunity for a permanent gift. God is offering you right now Something amazing if you stop being secret and uh, you stop being silent, stop judging yourself and others and become the kind of person who lives in the kingdom of God, a free gift of God's grace. I want to tell you, wherever you are, don't be ashamed. Don't be worried. You have nothing to prove. God has already proved it. You are loved. You're not what you do. You're not what you have. You know what people say about you? You are loved by God. And when you live in that place, you'll have all the power in the world to do great things. And you'll have great things. And people will say great things about you. And that is true. Lord, we thank you for your love. You love us as we are, not as we should be. And you will bring us there. You love us enough to not leave us there. We trust you, Jesus. We follow you and we believe in what you taught us. We love you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thanks for being here. I, I hope you guys leave feeling encouraged. Go relax today. Enjoy your day. It's a gift from God. Every day is a gift from God. Make it count. And now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hi, I'm Bobby Shuler, and I just want to say, if you've just finished Christmas, maybe you're coming off of Christmas high. You know the time when you just see people you love, you exchanged gifts, you had an incredible time, but now you're going into the new year. There's a new president, there's new leaders in Congress, you have all sorts of maybe challenges within business or whatever it is that you're doing. I just want to say you don't have to worry and stress this year. Christ is king, and he's going to carry you through to a terrific week and a terrific year. From all of us here at Shepherd's Grove, God loves you, and so do we. When you give to our ministry, we want to say a small thank you. So when you give a gift of $40 or more, 
we will send you a Creed of the Beloved Tumblr. Let it be a reminder that God is your provider. Every single week, we get literally thousands of letters from people all around the world who tell us that their lives were radically transformed. Every single letter we get, we open and we read it. Every prayer request we get, we pray for those people. And every time we do it, our team is so encouraged. And we're encouraged because lives are being changed. We want you to know that that's not our doing, that's your doing. When you give to this ministry, you are making such a big impact on people's lives. This is crazy. Like every week we have to raise lots and lots of money to pay for airtime. If one month goes by that we don't get money, we go off the air. And we are so, so thankful for your generosity. Here's one story that was touched because of your generosity. Dear Bobby, I am an inmate at a correctional facility here in Tennessee. I have been incarcerated since February 1998 but only recently discovered Hour of Power. I am a stronger, more seeking Christian because of the message Jesus gives through you. And even I, a sinner who is locked away for a crime, still feel the love and forgiveness of Christ. You have helped me realize that, though many may look down upon me, God controls everything. I am forgiven, loved, and want to be a part of life again. I will be going home within the next few years. It's scary to consider what that will be like, but you have given me hope and faith. I thank you and I send you this high five in praise and gratitude for what Christ does through you. Cassidy, we want you to know you really are a part of this church family. High five right back at you. Seriously, you are not what you do. You're not what you have. You're not what people say about you. We believe that for you. We love you and we're rooting for you. For everybody else that's watching on TV, we just want you to know that this is one of thousands of stories of people who are touched because of your giving. So thank you and please continue to support this ministry as we reach people all around the world. This week, when you give to our ministry, we want to say a small thank you so when you give a gift of $40 or more, or a recurring gift of $20 or more, we will send you a Creed of the Beloved Tumblr. Every time you take a sip, let it be a reminder that God is your provider and He unconditionally loves you just as you are. Your donations are what get this message out to people like Cassie, and with your help, millions more. Write, call, or go online now.